Good afternoon and welcome. I am Paul Billings, National Senior Vice President of Public Policy at the American Lung Association. Thank you for joining us today for a conversation with Mary Nichols, Chair of the California Air Resources Board. We are honored that Mary is joining with Dan Fiorino, the Director of Center of the Center for Environmental Policy at American University, who will host today's live stream. On September 29th, the American Lung Association, along with American University Center for Environmental Policy and the Center for Environmental Filmmaking, hosted Clean Air for All, 50 Years of the Clean Air Act. At this symposium, I hope you're able to join us for the symposium or will be able to watch the recordings. At the symposium, we heard from an all-star lineup of regulators, litigators, and agitators. And today, we have someone who has been all three. Much has been written about Mary Nichols' contributions to public health and environmental protection. For decades, the United States and the world has looked to the state of California for leadership and innovation on the control of air pollution. And for much of that time, Mary Nichols has been California's clean air leader. What is clean air leadership? Well, you could look at some numbers. According to the US EPA, the implementation of the Clean Air Act from 1970 to 1990 prevented more than 250,000 deaths each year. And earlier this year, our friends at the Natural Resources Defense Council updated a subsequent EPA analysis of the benefits from 1990 to 2020. And NRDC found the Clean Air Act prevented 370,000 deaths in 2020 alone. You could also look at the dramatic improvements in California's air quality. Although it still dominates our state of the air reports list of most polluted cities, California's air is dramatically cleaner today than even a decade ago. But to truly appreciate what Mary's work means, take a deep breath. Hold it and let it out. America's air is so much cleaner today because of the impressive work and dedication of people like Mary Nichols, and we cannot take it for granted. Today's event is being recorded and the recording will be publicly available after the event. Feel free to use the chat function to ask questions. We will try to get to as many questions as we can. I urge you to extend this conversation on social media using the hashtags Clean Air for All and the Clean Air Act. The American Lung Association thanks our co-hosts at the American University Center for Environmental Policy and the Center for Environmental Filming. I hope everyone has had a chance to view the award-winning film Unbreathable, The Fight for Healthy Air. You can check it out at unbreathable.org for more information. To start today's event, we have a special clip from Unbreathable. I arrived in Los Angeles in uh, the fall of 1971, and as we dropped down into the LA basin, we saw the smog that was hanging over the basin, and it was a very peculiar orange, I've called it day glow orange, color and it was ugly. Mary Nichols was fresh out of law school when she arrived in Los Angeles to join the fight for healthy air. I found a job within my first few months working for a public interest law firm called the Center for Law and the Public Interest. We knew then, and it's still true today, that the most important source of air pollution is motor vehicles, cars, trucks, and other things that move. And that not enough was being done to bring new technologies online that would clean up the fuels and clean up the vehicles. Nichols was just 27 when she filed the first lawsuit under the Clean Air Act. In 2006, the threat of global warming was making headlines. Scientists had proven that the burning of fossil fuels was creating carbon emissions and seriously destabilizing the health of our planet. The effects of climate change were threatening public health in unprecedented ways. There was more at stake than ever in the fight for healthy air. Under Republican Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, California became the first state to pass a global warming act. We passed that bill uh, that said that we're going to reduce greenhouse gases by 25 percent by the year 2020. When we signed that bill, there were environmentalists, Democrats, car manufacturers, and business people 
We didn't sit down and say, I don't want to talk to you. We sat down long enough to figure out what they would like, what the Democrats would like, and what we as Republicans would like. And how do we get the business community on board? In 2007, the U.S. Supreme Court made a critical ruling. It determined that greenhouse gases fell under the Clean Air Act and must be regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency to prevent harm to public health. Over the next eight years, President Barack Obama used the Clean Air Act to set higher federal standards to limit air pollution and to promote alternative energy technologies. From the cars and trucks we drive to the homes and businesses in which we live and work, we've changed fundamentally the way we consume energy. Now keep in mind the skeptics said these actions would kill jobs. And instead we saw, even as we were bringing down these carbon levels, the longest streak of job creation in American history. We drove economic output to new highs and we drove our carbon pollution to its lowest levels in two decades. People in general have a great deal of faith, which I think is actually well justified, in the ability of uh, American industry to come up with technology solutions when they're put to the test. Good afternoon, Dan Fiorino. I'm director of the Center for Environmental Policy in the School of Public Affairs at American University. Thanks for the introduction, Paul. And I am thrilled today to be able to host this conversation with Mary Nichols. And you learned a little bit about Mary's contributions to clean, out, clean air over the years, both in California and, and nationally. And actually, when you do it in California, it has an effect nationally because California has been such a leader in clean air over the last several decades. So thank you, Mary, for joining us today. Pleasure. Um, and let's, let, let's start with the film. So the excerpt from the film quotes your reactions to the state of the air in 1971 when you arrived in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, you've been part of the struggle for clean air since then. Um, what, what do you think is the key to the success of the Clean Air Act and, and of our programs in general and sort of getting where we are? Well, let's start with the law. Um, as uh, federal statutes go, it was, and I think it still is, the most powerful action forcing uh, piece of legislation that the Congress has ever passed. It came into existence at the height of bipartisan interest and concern about air pollution. And it was written by uh, a group of people, also bipartisan, uh, led by the Senate, uh, who believed that uh, you could use and should use uh, the authority of the government to uh, push American industry to come up with uh, technologies which maybe existed but had not ever really been fully uh, mm -hmm. deployed and that by setting deadlines and also something that was really uh, unique at the time, which was the idea of a citizen suit provision that allowed for individual citizens to challenge the government when they felt it was not carrying out its responsibilities under the law. So, you know, we had the science, we had mm -hmm. the public uh, and the political process responded. So I think that's, that really is the bedrock. And I'm glad that the Lung Association Association, uh, despite COVID, has uh, has done so much to celebrate its 50th anniversary. Yeah, that, you you originally were going to be the keynote speaker at our March event before everything changed. So we're really glad we could we could talk to you now. So lots of progress um, has been. California and other parts of the country are facing some big challenges. What do you see as the big challenges? that California will face in the coming years in, in getting the cleaner air? Well, of course, the more we learn about the impacts of air pollution on human health, the more we know that it's even more serious and more insidious than we had thought at lower and mm -hmm. lower levels. So, uh, you know, 
we used to talk about how uh, you'd have to get to background in order to really eliminate the worst effects of smog. And essentially that's true if by background you mean naturally occurring emissions without any human combustion of fuels that would uh, create pollution in the air. We have to get to just about as close to that as it's possible to do. And then we still have to do more because global warming, uh, which is also a form of air pollution caused by basically the same activities, uh, keeps making the problem uh, even harder because of its role in creating more smog. So um, that's the fundamental challenge that we face. But of course, the the real challenge is is our own seeming inability to solve the political impasse that has kept us from taking the kinds of big and bold actions that uh, that we need to take. And that's why California's uh, ability and willingness to step out and increasingly other states as well um, is so yeah. important. Yeah. So uh, yeah, the, the law certainly accomplished a lot, but, but much remains. I wanna uh, look at vehicles um, California has always been a leader in pushing the state of technology and practice for cleaner cars and trucks, including greenhouse gas requirements. Uh, and of course, California has this special authority under the Clean Air Act to set more stringent standards than the federal standards. And that has been really a mainstay of U.S. air pollution policy. Now the Trump administration is trying to take that back. I wonder if you could tell us where, where that stands in terms of the, the California waiver stands and um, what is at stake? Well, the Trump administration has taken regulatory action to withdraw California's waiver to enforce greenhouse gas emission standards. They haven't tried and I don't think they really yeah. would dare to try to take away our waiver for conventional air pollutants. Mm. Uh, but, uh, but they have said that they think that greenhouse gases are not covered by the Clean Air Act and therefore the waiver provision doesn't apply to California. We are in court on that issue uh, and we uh, of course are doing everything we can to, uh, to win that case. Uh, but we're also hoping that uh, the government will change its mind and that we'll prevail in the court of public opinion if, uh, regardless of what yeah. happens to the courts. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's very likely. And of course, a political change could sort of change the, the picture and what's coming from here. And what is it now? About 13 other states now uh, follow uh, the California emission standards, right? So. Yes. It's, it's not only a California issue, it's an issue for a large part of the country. That's right. Other states were given the option to uh, sign in to the California standards as opposed to going with the weaker national standards. And 13 states and the District of Columbia have chosen to do that. Uh, and recently, when it comes to some of the uh, rollback initiatives that the Trump administration has taken on clean air and on climate change, uh, we actually are now working with a group of 21 states uh, mm. that are part of the United States Climate Alliance, whose governors are also uh, backing California or just sticking together and insisting yeah. that the United States should follow the Paris Accord and should continue moving forward on, uh, on climate action. Yeah, that's, that's very promising. Um, Governor Newsom recently issued a call for 100% zero emission vehicles, I think by 2035. So how, how will California get to this goal? Well, uh, it's not uh, going to be easy, but we think it's well within our sights. Uh, it's a combination of things, of course, um, including a mandate on the manufacturers to sell, uh, to produce and sell um, zero emission vehicles, which can be plug-in or uh, could also be fuel cell vehicles. And in some cases they, they will be. Um, and then the state, through a combination of incentives and regulations, 
uh, encouraging the fleet to turn over faster than it would otherwise. Uh, this, uh, the, the 2035 deadline is for new cars being offered for sale to be 100% zero emissions. There's also a provision that by 2045, there has to be a complete turnover to zero, not just for uh, new cars, but for uh, off-road vehicles, for trucks, um, all the engines that, that we are able to regulate will have to be at zero. And frankly, that's there because it's necessary if we're going to meet our um, climate neutrality goals by 2045. That's, mm -hmm. that's what needs to happen. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because vehicles are such an important part of, of the problem. Do you know of any other states that are considering anything like this or sort of following California's lead in this case? Uh, yes, absolutely. New York has already done something mm. similar and mm. uh, the state of Colorado, which was not one of the original so-called 177 states that follow California's standards, has its own uh, executive order issued by the governor, which is slightly different in format, but it comes out to the same conclusion. Um, so I think we're going to see more action on this front as well. Uh, certainly, the, you know, the underlying the motivation is public health and, and uh, the quality of our life on our planet. But um, there's also an economic mm -hmm. incentive for states to do this as well, because other states have seen how California's uh, initiatives here have led to uh, now a situation where our number one export from California is not almonds or grapes or any other agricultural produce, as you might think. It's electric vehicles mm. and components, yeah. parts as well. But yeah, yeah the electric, electric vehicle is a, is a growth industry here. And I think it is worldwide as well. Yeah, definitely. And a, and a number of other countries are setting similar targets. And at the city level, we're seeing it happening. So I think that will, that will speed it up. So um, an another area where California has been um, innovating lately uh, in response to AB 617, the Community Air Protection Program is designed to reduce exposures in communities that are harmed the most by air pollution, the really vulnerable communities. And we know that um, there are uh, inequitable distributions of, of air pollution and problems associated with it. And that involves significant community participation in, in driving local solutions. So can you tell us a bit about this program and sort of how you see it fitting in with what historically the state has been doing and the, and the country has been doing uh, under the Clean Air Act? Sure. Um, it's, a, it's a big question, actually. Um, <laughs> We certainly have learned uh, and increasingly been uh, made aware of the fact in the political arena uh, as a result of this past year's uprising of uh, upwelling really of popular uh, concern, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and the focus on uh, that's really deeply embedded structural racism and inequities that exist in our society, there's a direct relationship between health and other forms of well-being, including economic well-being, that it's, it's a sort of obvious when you think about it, uh, but, you know, being, being poor, being isolated, being without employment are things that also lead to bad health outcomes as well. So um, in the world of public health, uh, I think there's been a real uh, uh, renewal of commitment. Uh, and I think it is a renewal to uh, an approach that is not top down, but is actually bottom up when it mm -hmm. comes to bringing in the public and having them directly involved in designing these um, big regulatory initiatives that otherwise, you know, even in a state like California that has strong open meeting laws and a lot of 
public and political interest in pollution control, we still face a situation where most of the time when the ARB or the local air districts are moving forward, who's in the room is the regulated industries and mm -hmm. maybe a couple of representatives of public health organizations like Lung Association or environmental activist groups. And so um, it's just, uh, it, it, regardless of how, uh, how much integrity there is uh, on the part of the agency, and I, I like to think that there's a lot, um, even so, you know, there's just a, a, an inequality of power when it comes to uh, who's in there trying to push the decision-making process. And so AB, 16, AB 617 is one response to that that's been growing over time uh, by requiring the agencies to uh, go out into the community to create uh, advisory groups and to develop community-based air pollution plans. And I think that the, the climate legislation and our actions on climate have really helped to push this uh, because uh, when ARB started designing the climate plan, our so-called scoping plan for climate, one of the things that we did was to put in a, a market-based program, a cap and trade program. And there was tremendous concern and opposition on the part of many uh, groups from the environmental justice uh, community that we would be um, in effect allowing trading of pollutants in ways that could lead to even worse concentrations of pollution in some of the most disadvantaged communities. In order to address that concern, um, the legislature uh, took action and said uh, ARB was going to have to shift the way that we also went about doing our business on pollution regulation. And, you know, it's a work in progress. We're still yeah. in the midst of it, but I think it's revolutionary in a, in a very good way. Yeah, another way that uh, state can be a, a pace setter, and that's certainly going to be an issue in a lot of areas, particularly urban areas, um, where there are concentrations of pollution and particular toxics and others that, that we're concerned about. So uh, I think it'll be interesting for all of us to follow what happens in the state. And it's a good use sort of top down and bottom up. Top down and bottom up can work together effectively. Absolutely. Top down goals and Clean Air Act strategies and then work and, and sort of fill in. Right. Well, and I guess I should say in this era of um, anti-government populism that the, the concern was not that, um, you know, we had this secret agenda uh, or these hidden scientists, uh, you know, hidden science, secret science that we were using. Uh, in all of my experience in working with legislators, working with community organizations, I've never heard anything other than respect and a desire to see more of the science uh, mm -hmm. and a, use the science more in a proactive way in the regulatory system. So this is not a kind of a rejection of the bureaucracy and what the bureaucracy is doing, it's more of a demand that the regulations and the bureaucrats get out there and respond to the biggest concerns that the people have. Right, and I think well, we all would like to see the science used <laughs> responsibly as the basis for decisions. Right. So I think uh, the audience we have will certainly applaud that. Um, early this summer, we co-sponsored with the American Lung Association, a program on some of the research on COVID and air pollution and the fact that, um, you know, the severity and, and fatalities and so on were um, from COVID were more serious that, that air pollution is a kind of um, risk factor uh, in that. Is that something that has come up in, in, in the, what the board has been looking into or something that is maybe relevant to the community program? Oh, absolutely. Well, we have two physicians who are appointed members of our board, both of whom happen to 
uh, do research uh, in this area. And so they've been developing the very fine grained analyses of what the impacts in California are. Uh, in addition, the press in covering the COVID uh, crisis and, and who is affected and how they're affected is uh, writing stories almost every day about the differential impact of, um, of the virus in different communities, largely depending on um, ethnicity and uh, race and, and income and also on the levels of air pollution. So um, these things, the, the, these connections are, are very well made and are being documented in a more detailed ways all the time. Uh, and I think um, it's particularly telling that um, many of the uh, people who are uh, risking their lives and their health in the frontline jobs, I'm, I'm not just talking about nurses or healthcare workers, but also the people who, you know, bring the deliveries to your doorstep uh, are people who come from disadvantaged communities. And so um, it's, a, it's really keeping an awareness of the inequities very much front and center. Yeah, okay. Um, I'd like to talk just a bit before we go to audience questions on um, California's energy and climate leadership. And, and obviously clean air and climate have lots and lots of connections as you pointed out. Uh, a friend of mine used to say that if you want to see where the United States will be in 10 years, look at where California is now. Um, and um, we're hoping that will be the case in energy and climate. But Sort of, could you just give your thoughts on what you think the, the biggest influences California has had on other states when it comes to climate and energy policy? It's um, hard to list them all. And I, <laughs> I also don't want to be guilty of saying, you know, California is the best at everything because right. although there are some areas where I think we deserve to pat ourselves on the back. There are other areas, uh, for example, groundwater, which we mm. didn't even begin to regulate until quite recently, uh, or uh, some of the uh, innovative ideas about urban planning and transportation, uh, which are also connected to health and environment where um, California cannot claim to be number one. But because uh, climate in the sense of literally what you see when you walk outside your home every day is so integral to California's view of itself with our long coastline and our mountains and our uh, tremendous attraction for people who want to be in the out of doors, you know, starting with the early movie makers who flocked to Los Angeles because of the air uh, back, at the, back in the day. Um, it's been tied up with our sense of uh, what California is and what it needs to be uh, that, we, that we care about the quality of our air, including how it looks as well as how it feels. So um, we have been innovators when it comes to um, everything that relates to not just vehicles and their emissions, but fuels of all kinds, our power system. Again, uh, going back to at least uh, the 70s and maybe before when California phased out you know, burning of any kind of fuels that had sulfur in them, uh, switched to all natural gas, which was considered a weird thing to do back in those days. Uh, we had to fight with the federal government over our desire to use natural gas in that way because, uh, you know, many people from other parts of the country thought it should only be used for heating. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we had a policy that drove us in the direction of renewables and set standards that required our electric utilities to um, eventually phase out all combustion um, at the same time that we were starting to move forward on, um, on, on the vehicle uh, regulations as well. 
um, I think there's also this uh, desire for innovation in technologies of all kinds that have led to increasing focus on the part of our regulatory agencies and the legislature on making sure that communities in all parts of the state um, are served by broadband and by, you know, advanced communications. And um, so it's, uh, uh, these are areas where I think we can claim uh, honestly, that uh, that we've been willing to be experimenters, and that does go along with being a state that is attractive to venture capital and has been hospitable to um, educational uh, aspirants from all over the world. You know, the University of California can claim to be the most attractive of all uh, higher education institutions anywhere. And because of those things, we also have the ability to innovate. Yeah, and I think California really is a good example of how um, you don't have to give up economic innovation and success to be responsible on the environment. And well, I think, I think it's, it's the opposite. I mean, when politicians yeah. in some parts of the country were just beginning to be willing to say, you can have a clean economy, a sound economy, and a clean environment, sorry, and they can go hand in hand. You know, we were already at the point of saying, it's yeah. not just that they go hand in hand, it's that they're essential to each other. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they, they complement their, 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 their synergies and so on. Um, from those of us on the East Coast, we, we read about the wildfires and just the, the, the terrible toll they're taking. And my sense is that that um, even sort of pushed up the commitment in the state to, to try and do something about climate change. And it's a sort of a con, the wildfires are partly a consequence of the change in climate. They also create some pretty, pretty serious air pollution issues that I'm sure you've had to deal with. So what Yes. What effect have the wildfires had on both the climate and the air side? Well, the air quality effects of the fires are uh, on people's minds constantly uh, because you can see and smell and feel them and it's terrible. Uh, it's depressing, uh, it's ugly, and it uh, is literally sapping uh, productivity because people mm -hmm. don't want to go out. Uh, out of doors, even if you're not going to your office, you might be going out to ride your bike or get some exercise uh, or take your kids somewhere to a park or whatever. And all of those things are just, you know, unattractive uh, when the air is really bad. So it's been a really bad summer and the fire season uh, is not over yet. It, on top of, of course, the uh, terrible toll in lives and, and property that the fires have taken uh, directly. The one thing that it has done, I believe, in addition to solidifying people's support, as you, as you indicate, for um, moving away from fossil fuels, moving away from combustion of all kinds, has been um, that it is also, I think, helped to make the connection between natural resources policies and our direct controls over emissions. So, you know, the part of the uh, part of the emissions equation that I work with on a day to day basis, of course, is vehicles and fuels and mm -hmm. things that, you know, industries mm -hmm. that combust things, uh, but there's the other half of the, of the puzzle, uh, which is our land and water and trees and all of the things that um, hold on to uh, carbon, hold on to the pollution and uh, that we need to have healthy. And we've now, you know, been, we've been damaging those things. We know there's already a loss of biodiversity of uh, species that have uh, already uh, been impacted by the change in climate. And um, we're uh, certainly well aware of the fact that the trees and the forests uh, and in many instances, uh, other lands are, are also being negatively affected 
by climate change as well. Agricultural productivity, the yeah. iconic California wine industry, you yeah. know, certain kinds of grapes uh, can't, be, can't be grown. Other crops have to be moved or changed. And, you know, agriculture has been also very innovative in this state, but there's a limit and everybody knows there's a limit. So I think um, the, uh, one of the major lessons to be learned here is that while we have to be all in on um, eliminating the sources of pollution, we also have to be improving the ability, the resilience uh, of, our, of our natural environment to be able to store yeah. and sequester uh, carbon as well. And so that's, I think, going to be an area of increasing activity. It's already attracting a lot of attention. The governor signed a, an, a, another big executive order a week ago, uh, directing all of the agencies, including ours, to start, you know, setting really strong science-based uh, targets for um, carbon sequestration. So um, that's that's the next big frontier. I'm sure it is. So let me turn now, we're getting some interesting questions from our um, audience. So let me go to a few of these. Um, oh, here's an interesting one. Given the significant clean air challenges that remain, what should be at the top of the EPA administrator's to-do list over the next four years? Uh, <laughs> where to begin? <laughs> Um, <laughs> where, where to begin? Well, I, I think the first thing I would say is uh, that, that really has to be reversed is the rejection of science and yeah. scientists. That, that's fundamental to everything else and to all the programs, not just the air program. Um, you know, the, the dismissal of people of impeccable credentials who appear to have only committed the sin of being in favor of enforcing the laws uh, and, you know, attempting to recruit people who would raise questions or even be, um, you know, totally opposed to uh, doing anything about human caused climate change. The, that's probably the single biggest scandal, I would say, and the thing that has to be addressed first. So just restore the, in, the integrity of science and the role of of science in yes. studying and, and making decisions. Until you, until you restore the role of science and, the, and make it clear that decisions are going to be based on science, you can't recruit the kind of people that you mm -hmm. want or keep the people you want to work in the other areas as well. So that's number one. And probably second to that would be restoring respect for the laws themselves and not keep on subverting them as they have in all of these cases that we've been as California litigating with EPA now. Our Attorney General has, uh, has a huge uh, docket of cases of uh, all kinds, but mainly focused on clean air, where it's delay, rollback, non-enforce. You know, really the only good thing that you can say about EPA in the last four years is they didn't stop enforcing existing regulations that you know we were able to continue to work with them when you saw uh, instances of fraud uh, you know outright mm -hmm. uh, abuse of, uh, of existing uh, regulations they have they have actually maintained an enforcement program but at every other step where they could find ways to subvert they've they've done it yeah, yeah. well here here's an interesting one uh, given your experience with the Clean Air Act, um, how urgently does the Clean Air Act need a fresh update from Congress? Or the, is there a need to, or, to change the Clean Air Act or update it in certain ways, or can we do a lot that we wanna do with what we have now? So the last time that you know, there was a, a real uh, serious effort at amending the Clean Air Act uh, was a couple of decades ago. I think the norm has been about every 10 years. There was a, a refresh and an updating. And ironically, I would say every time uh, Congress started with a desire to make the um, act more friendly to polluters, 
uh, they've ended up adding additional provisions and requirements, although there have been some areas where they've innovated, for example, the addition of the acid rain program that mm -hmm. I had the pleasure of um, helping to roll out when I was uh, in the air office at EPA and the Clinton yeah. administration. So that was that was something really new that hadn't been tried before. And so it, it, it attracted a lot of interest and attention. But the biggest question I think is whether you can do more to address uh, climate change yeah. without new legislation. Uh, and I think that while the Clean Air Act can be used to a much greater extent than it has been and should be, um, there certainly are places where it would be helpful uh, and uh, you know really make a huge difference in, in having the entire government uh, mobilized, which it should be, um, if if Congress would uh, would take action. So I think it's it's important that they do that. But I'm not so sure that it requires a complete redo or reauthorization of the Clean Air Act. In fact, I tend to think that would. Uh, bog things down for another decade yeah. and that it might be better to look at some areas where you need some additional authority rather than to um, you know to try to do a, a fundamental change of the act it's particularly if you want to talk about you know divisiveness or polarization in the country um, it's just it's it's going to be hard enough I think to mobilize a consensus around taking yeah. action on climate uh, and that we should, that's really where we should be focusing our attention. Right. And so to decide what additional authorities or strategies are, are important, the, I mean, the basic model has held up pretty well over the oh, years. So it yeah. absolutely has. It doesn't yeah. mean that there aren't ways you could improve the administration of the law. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you always uh, should be looking for for ways to make it simpler and easier for people to comply and look at mm -hmm. whether there are things that are, um, you know, practices that have built up over time that are uh, getting in the way of um, actually making progress on cleaning up the air. But I think a lot of what we've seen happening the last four years, and maybe that's part of why I'm so reluctant to suggest, you know, well, let's go in and do a revision if we, you know, have a friendly Congress, is that um, these attempts are, uh, you know, to, to make, the, make the system work better often end up just making it worse. And that certainly has been what's happened in the, in the, the, the Trump administration basically took the list that was handed to them yes. by the Washington lobbyists for every major trade group, starting with the Chamber of Commerce, and just systematically under Scott Pruitt and then Andrew Wheeler went through and, you know, checked all the boxes that these are the things they were going to get rid of didn't turn out so well. You know, part of the reason for that is not just ideology, it's competence. You have to actually go through rulemaking with notice and comment and a record in order to deregulate uh, and have a rationale for why you're doing it. Yes. So we don't, we don't want to go down that path. Yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of um, decisions that were made, especially early on, ran into trouble in the courts. And because yes. adequately prepared and, and justified and thought right. through, and you're right, it was, let's run through the deregulation to-do list and not think too much about the details. So I, I right. totally agree on that. Uh, we have a question on zero emission vehicles. Washington State is considering a bill to require 100% ZEV sales by 2030 in Oregon. Oregon. <laughs> Uh, is starting a rulemaking to adopt a ZEV deadline. What is your schedule for rulemaking to adopt the 100% ZEV mandate that the governor announced through executive order? So uh, the underlying uh, piece of information here is that the executive order didn't just <clears throat> take effect automatically. It mm. required ARB to go out and do a rulemaking to make it happen. And we have not announced the schedule yet, but we'll be starting on that pretty soon. Okay, so there, there is work to do. So the executive order, that 
establishes the legal requirement and now it's a matter of developing the rulemaking. Right. It set the parameters that said, you know, okay. 100% of sales by 2035, but that still requires uh, an actual regulation. And there's a lot of details embedded in that yeah. that we have to work through. Yeah, yeah, a lot of work to do. Um, a question about uh, the courts. It appears the Supreme Court is headed into a more conservative era. I don't know why somebody would say that, but uh, <laughs> with the possible confirmation of the current nominee. Are there any upcoming significant decisions coming up for a rollback of some sorts that could happen? So some ways where the Supreme Court and, and, and other courts moving in a certain direction, I guess it's what, what are the, the likely environmental consequences? So the, the environmental law community has been saying for some years now, excuse me, I have a dog who you could probably hear in the background there heading, heading out. Um, <laughs> so uh, the environmental legal community has been worried for some time now about the erosion of respect for the administrative agencies by the courts. And as we were talking about before, um, implementing the Clean Air Act or other major environmental laws is, requires um, expert agencies and they have to make decisions. And so it, it, the courts can either try to replicate what they're doing or they can give them some degree of deference. And there's a famous case called Chevron, mm -hmm. which is the one that says that the courts are gonna basically, when it comes to implementing a statute that the agency is responsible for, their interpretation is going to be given great weight. Um, that uh, decision has been undergoing erosion for quite some time now. And uh, I think many people feel that with an even more conservative uh, makeup that the court would go even further in that direction. Um, and there's certainly reason to be concerned about that. Uh, I would say though that people tend to forget that the case that told uh, EPA that they couldn't just ignore um, greenhouse gases and pretend that they weren't a pollutant of which they should be looking at regulating uh, was decided uh, by Justice Scalia. And uh, it's not because it was a, because he was a, a, a liberal, because uh, obviously he was not, um, but he was a believer in reading the statutes and also in the, in science i mean not in, in not just ignoring what was what was in the record of a case so i don't think you can assume that uh, that a tilt to the right on issues like uh, rights to abortion or rights of people to marry who they choose uh, automatically is a bad uh, tilt for the environment but it's not uh, I think we don't know is the right. Yeah, uh, we 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 don't know for sure. But uh, I don't think anybody feels that uh, a new court is going to be more interested in groundbreaking environmental uh, laws, and and really the the impetus here and the the politics are that new laws, you know, big new laws uh, should be passed. By the Congress, and um, there was a serious effort under Obama. Uh, you know, the House uh, passed a Waxman-Markey legislation. Uh, it was a definitely a big step forward at the time. It was a masterpiece of legislative, um, you know, uh, uh, rulemaking, legislative uh, deal making really I guess to get the to get it put together uh, so that it would be uh, cover the entire country and um, uh, it didn't make it in the Senate uh, so that was the end of that uh, there hasn't been any serious effort to deal with uh, climate at all uh, in the last four years so I think we're I think we're overdue for that kind of an initiative yeah very good well here's a question from Stan Myberg. Um, based on your experience, what message would you have for young people considering public service in these polarized times? 
Stan Myberg, in case anybody doesn't know him, um, is the deputy administrator at EPA. He is a career EPA person who had a very distinguished career. He was in Texas when I was at EPA in, mm -hmm. in the Clinton years, and somebody who I know to have a very strong streak of idealism about public service. Um, I uh, talk to young people a lot. I'm fortunate to um, be in a position where I get to talk to interns, but I also have grad kids myself and um, friends with kids that like to come around and chat from time to time. And so I feel like um, I can say with some uh, certainty that there's a Idealism is not dead. In fact, if anything, although Greta Thunberg and the Sunrise Movement may be, you know, at the head of the wave, that among people who may not be quite so strongly activists, there still is a great interest in um, seeing change happen in the direction of a better care for, for our planet. And uh, people ask, well, you know, should they think about working in the government or is that just hopeless? And I uh, always encourage them to look at uh, what possibilities are out there uh, in the public service arena. Um, I think it's, um, <laughs> until very recently, I would have said that even when the public or the political winds sort of are blowing one way or another, um, there's always good work to be done uh, by people who have technical skills, legal skills, um, and a desire to work with the with the public, uh, that there's you know all kinds of jobs out there uh, in the public arena that are very worth doing and satisfactory careers to be had, and I still think that's true. I don't think it's the mm -hmm. only way, but I do mm -hmm. think it is one way. And I think it's essential. I don't think you can expect the private sector, no matter what, to uh, take care of everything all by themselves. I think we yeah. need to have that fundamental basis of laws and regulations to uh, keep everybody on an even keel and to push technology forward. And Stan, Stan is now at a university. He's at Wake Forest University. Ah, well, good for him. And um, we talk occasionally. And I know um, both of us have, we really think that the students are, they're good, they're talented. They, they have, they're idealistic, but a lot of good pragmatism too to, to realize how to get things done. So I know Stan and I are very optimistic about the, the next generation. That's great. Uh, and, and I think that's that's very promising. Yep, I am too. Stan is also working with us. We're doing a project now looking at the environmental workforce of the future. Aha. Uh -huh. We'll be working with him on that. That's great. Okay, let's see. We'll do one or two more questions. Um, one aspect of the new regulations that concern me about the policy for electric cars and eliminating pollutants is lowering pollutants from trucks and the timing of reaching these goals will come too late. So it's really focused on, and I, we, I've heard um, on other occasions just the, the challenges of freight transportation and freight corridors and, and trucks and so on. So uh, maybe you could talk a bit about how the, the executive order applies to passenger vehicles. No, it applies to all. Okay, it applies to all. Okay. Yeah, there's a 2045 uh, deadline again in the executive order okay. for uh, the entire fleet to become zero emission. And in the case of the trucks that are used at the ports, uh, because those are in the midst of some of the most heavily impacted communities of people, um, the requirement is by 2035 for all of the vehicles that are hauling stuff around on the ports to be zero emission vehicles. You know, my colleague, uh, Dan Sperling, who uh, mm -hmm. runs the transportation program at UC Davis and has been a member of the board now uh, for uh, almost a decade, I guess. Um, when we first started this new round of regulations for heavy duty vehicles was pretty pessimistic about how 
much more difficult it was going to be than working with passenger cars. And certainly over, over the course of all the years of, under the Clean Air Act, we've been much slower to see progress uh, from, from trucks and buses and all the heavy duty engines. Mm -hmm. They're just, it's a, the, the field is more competitive and more different types of applications. And of course, these are vehicles that are used for work, uh, commercial mm -hmm. vehicles generally. Yeah. So um, there's a much stronger economic uh, basis. Somebody doesn't go out and buy a, a new truck because it's cool looking, at least <laughs> not very not very often. So um, uh, it, it's been tough, but what's happened since we started setting stronger goals and it became obvious that this was an area where, you know, there'd been some neglect over time and we needed to work harder and faster to try to get them cleaned up. The explosion of innovation in the last uh, couple of years is amazing. The number of new companies that are popping up with new technologies, mm -hmm. uh, the competition out there, um, China is a part of it. Uh, without a doubt, we have companies that are Chinese based that are entering into the field here, but we also have the companies that have been the incumbent, um, you know, giants for, for years, Volvo, uh, Daimler and others, um, you know, really stepping up and saying, no, we, we're going to do something completely different here. We can, we can do zero emissions. I think when Ford Motor Company announced the electric F-150 for a lot of people, that was a signal that the time, mm, yes. the floodgates were going to open, um, you know, we're, this is no longer going to be a backwater when it comes to um, energy and, and environmental policy. Yeah, that's a, that's a great example. I just saw an ad for that recently. <laughs> so one last question, then I just have a closing question. Uh, Mary, will California step up to regulate methane gas production after the federal rollback? How big a priority is it to control methane emissions? And what is your strategy um, for, for dealing with methane? Well, first of all, uh, as with everything, um, you got to know what the problem is and where the problem is. Mm. And we have invested uh, directly and indirectly in improving the science here. Uh, and one of the things we have learned is that there's a lot more of it out there than people thought, uh, certainly even a few years ago, and that there's a lot more of it that's um, being emitted from conventional uh, sources that thought that they were under control and have turned out to have way more leaks, spills, et cetera, than people uh, were thinking. So that's number one, is to get a better grip on how bad the problem really is. Uh, certainly the uh, California, the discovery of a long-term large leak from a gas storage field, uh, you know, by our major Southern California gas utility was a wake-up call. Uh, but there's, there's been now some work done, uh, we've done work with JPL, uh, have had airplane flyovers and we're working with a, a group of people uh, to develop a, a constellation of satellites that can um, mm. measure methane regularly. Uh, we need to develop some new strategies as well. Uh, and one of the things that's already happening, by the way, we do have a methane role that, relies, that uh, relates to oil and gas production. But um, there's, a, there's a lot more that needs to be done, especially when it comes to um, both the vegetation uh, and um, a gas that's uh, being utilized in appliances and impacting people indoors as well as outdoors. So um, uh, on that front, um, there's, this is gonna be an area of a lot of activity. The State Energy Commission, which sets right. standards for appliances is uh, very actively looking at, uh, at, at a whole suite of new standards for, uh, for uh, things like hot water heaters or stoves mm -hmm. that are used in people's homes. Mm -hmm. So I'll conclude with uh, <clears throat> just to ask you for two pieces of advice. So um, my class, my undergraduate class is listening to this program. Um, so the first question is, 
What advice do you have for students and other young people who want to address the climate crisis? And my, the second is, what piece of advice, we know that you're, you'll be leaving the, the board at the end of the year, what piece of advice would you give to, to your successor? So first, what, what advice to students? Uh, you know what I'm going to say, but I'll say it anyway, um, because I've worked in the public arena for most of my life. Um, vote. Pay attention to what people say and also to what they do. And don't take it for granted that just because they say they're for clean air and clean water, that means they're actually going to take the right kind of actions. So interrogate, interrogate the uh, candidates and, and and use your power at the ballot box. That's probably the most important thing. And then the second would be um, for, for anybody is, um, you know, to look within your own community at things that can be done to improve the quality mm -hmm. of the environment for people. And I think, you know, not everybody is going to be, you know, doing this kind of work professionally, although hopefully lots of them will. And yeah. they'll find places, yeah. uh, you know, and all around our society. Wherever you are, you can still be working in the environmental, uh, for environmental protection if you are keeping your eyes open for ways to do things better, to waste less fuel, to, you know, find better technologies and uh, avoid waste. All of those things are, all of those efficiency kinds of issues are are also environmental issues. And so I hope that people will continue to be active, practicing, card-carrying environmentalists, uh, <laughs> whatever jobs they, they end up in. And, and they, they are interested in the climate, they are interested in clean energy, and they're interested in, in, in environmental issues. So, so that's, right. and any bits of advice to who will come next in your, your role? Uh, well, do better than I did. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean, I, I think every generation can carry, you know, can carry things to a certain point. I certainly uh, benefited from the people who created the Air Resources Board and gave it the kind of powers that it did. Um, my predecessor, Tom Quinn, uh, was the first person to really um, take advantage of the uh, inherent power that ARB had in the standard setting area to take a much stronger profile on energy policy and became a, a key player uh, in a field that traditionally had been considered to be totally separate. You know, air pollution was kind of what you did with the tailpipes or the, yeah. uh, you know, the, the waste as opposed to getting into the heart of energy policy. And I'm sure that my predecessor, whoever she or he may be, will um, carry it to the next level. Excellent. Well, well we, we hope they, they do the, the, as well as you did, I uh, have to say. Um, thank you, Mary Nichols. It's been great to spend this time with you. Thanks for sharing your time and, and your thoughts. And I know students and everybody else listening in greatly appreciates it. So, so thank you very much. Um, thanks also to our friends at the American Lung Association. We've done a symposium, a film, uh, uh, this program, is, it's been a great pleasure. I hope everybody will check out the film, which stars Mary Nichols and Arnold Schwarzenegger and other people. Uh, just go to uh, unbreathable.org and you can do that. So thanks everybody for joining us. I know you're all people interested in clean air and climate, just like Mary Nichols and the rest of us. And I hope you'll keep working on that. So um, thank you, Mary, and uh, good evening. Bye. Thank you.